Produce syndrome. Produce syndrome is a rare genetic condition that causes excessive growth of your bones, skin, organs, and or tissues. The disease causes parts of your body to grow out of proportion with the rest of it. The overgrowth is usually asymmetrical, meaning it affects the right and left sides of your body differently. Newborn babies with Produce syndrome usually don't show any signs of the condition. The atypical growth starts to appear between the ages of 6 months and 18 months. It rapidly develops within 10 years and gets more severe as you age. Along with differences in your physical appearance, some people with produce may experience neurological issues. People with produce syndrome also have an increased risk of developing blood clots and tumors. Proteus was the ancient Greek god of change. Scientists named the condition Proteus syndrome because it can cause your body structures to change shapes over time. Who does Proteus syndrome affect? Proteus syndrome can affect anyone. But some studies show it affects men and people assigned male at birth slightly more often than women and people assigned female at birth. How common is Proteus syndrome? Produce syndrome is an extremely rare condition that affects fewer than 1 in 1 million people around the world. It's difficult to diagnose the disease because it's so rare and other conditions also cause asymmetrical overgrowth. So, it's hard to determine the true number of people with produce syndrome. Researchers believe some people go undiagnosed, while others are misdiagnosed with the condition. Overall, they believe less than a few hundred people worldwide have the disease. Signs and Symptoms of Produce Syndrome The first signs of Produce Syndrome usually appear between 6 months and 18 months of age when asymmetrical overgrowth begins. Asymmetric means it may affect one side of your body more than the other. The pattern and severity of overgrowth can vary greatly. It can affect almost any part of your body, including your bones, skin, organs, and tissues. The condition rapidly progresses during your first decade of life. The bones in your arms, legs, skull, and spine may develop irregularly. Your arms and legs may grow to significantly different lengths. You may have a severe curvature of your spine. Overgrowth may eventually affect the mobility of your joints. Produce syndrome can also cause abnormal skin growths. Thick, raised lesions called cerebriform connective tissue nevus often form. They're typically found on the soles of your feet but can also affect your hands. This kind of skin growth is rarely seen in any other condition. Abnormal growth of your blood vessels, including your capillaries and veins, may occur. Overgrowth of fat can affect your stomach, arms, and legs. Mostly benign tumors consisting of fatty tissue may develop. Some people with Produce syndrome have neurological abnormalities as well. These may include intellectual disabilities, seizures, and vision loss. Produce syndrome can cause distinctive facial features such as a long face, the outside corners of your eyes point downward, a flat nose bridge with wide nostrils, and an open mouth expression. Complications that can develop due to Produce syndrome. The most life-threatening complication of Produce syndrome is a type of blood clot called a deep vein thrombosis or DVT. DVTs affect the deep veins of your legs or arms most often, causing pain and swelling. If a DVT travels through your bloodstream to your lungs, it can cause a dangerous condition called pulmonary embolism. People with Produce syndrome most often die due to pulmonary embolisms. How do you get Produce syndrome? A change or mutation in the AKT1 gene causes Produce syndrome. The AKT1 gene helps control cell growth and division. A mutation in this gene disrupts a cell's ability to control its own growth. This allows the cell to grow and divide abnormally, leading to the overgrowth traits seen in Produce syndrome. Produce syndrome isn't an inherited condition and doesn't run in families. The genetic mutation occurs after the fertilization of the embryo. It occurs early during pregnancy when one cell in a developing fetus spontaneously mutates. 
As the mutated cell grows and divides, some cells will have the mutation and others won't. This is called a mosaic gene alteration. As the AKT1 gene mutation affects only some of your body's cells, the disease only affects part of your body. How is Produce Syndrome diagnosed? Your healthcare provider will perform a physical examination to diagnose Produce Syndrome. They'll use a specific checklist of characteristics of the condition. Three general characteristics of the disease must be present for your provider to consider the diagnosis. These include Mosaic distribution Mosaic distribution means the areas of excessive growth on your body are patchy. Some body parts show signs of overgrowth and others don't. Sporadic occurrence Sporadic occurrence means no one in your family has features of the condition. Progressive course Progressive course means the overgrowth has changed the look of your affected body parts significantly over time. In addition, your healthcare provider will look at other specific characteristics. You must have specific features from each category on your provider's checklist for them to diagnose you with Produce Syndrome. Tests that will be done to diagnose Produce Syndrome. The genetic mutation that causes Produce Syndrome isn't present in every cell in your body. This can make genetic testing complicated because a blood sample may not contain the mutation or only contain small traces of it. However, healthcare providers can find the mutated gene through DNA testing of a biopsy of some of your affected tissue. They'll use DNA from the sample to look for the mutated gene. Is there a cure for Produce Syndrome? There's no cure for Produce Syndrome. Produce syndrome treatment consists of managing your specific symptoms. You may work with a team of healthcare providers to help with your individual medical needs. An orthopedic surgeon may treat issues with your bones. There are many treatments available to reduce bone overgrowth in your arms, legs, fingers, and toes. They can correct issues with your spine and joints as well. You'll see a blood doctor before any surgeries to evaluate your risk for blood clots. You may see a skin doctor for issues with fatty overgrowth and skin changes. You may need aggressive and frequent treatment. For some issues, your healthcare provider may recommend a wait and see approach. This means they'll monitor your condition before moving forward with a particular treatment. What is the life expectancy for Produce Syndrome? The outlook for Produce Syndrome varies widely based on your affected body parts and the severity of your condition. Complications can be life-threatening and more commonly lead to death than the condition itself. Complications may include deep vein thromboses, pulmonary embolisms, and cancer. Pulmonary embolism is the most common cause of death among people with Produce Syndrome. Overall, about 25% of people with Produce Syndrome die before the age of 22. However, people with mild symptoms have a generally good prognosis with effective treatment. Tori Punch Tori Punch has Produce Syndrome. The 15-year-old's legs grow out of proportion to her body and bow so severely she has been unable to walk since she was about 18 months. The growth of her neck bones are affecting her breathing, as her neck bones are four times the size they should be. This is restricting her airway. Joseph Carey Merrick or the Elephant Man Joseph Carey Merrick was born in a slum in 1862. Within two years, he had started to develop swellings around his mouth, and over the course of a few months, these growths spread up across the young child's cheeks and forehead. By age 5 his skin became loose and rough, like that of an elephant. His physical deformities continued to grow, and it was around this age that he took a hard fall, damaging his left hip. The injury became infected, leaving Merrick permanently disabled as well as disfigured. By 1882 he could barely eat or speak due to being covered in deformities and protrusions. As a result, he had surgery and in years to come, the mask the surgeons removed from Merrick's face would be referred to as his trunk and Merrick himself would go down in history with a matching pseudonym, The Elephant Man. Take a look at these videos. He was a beautiful little boy and we just knew there were things 
We had to take him all the way from Kansas City to Wisconsin to get him diagnosed. And she said, well, there's this terrible syndrome that hopefully he doesn't have. And then we went up six months later and that's what he had. Less than one in one million. Those are the odds of being born with Proteus syndrome. Alex Hogue was diagnosed at the age of one and just a year later, his mom started the Proteus Syndrome Foundation. It was right when the internet was kind of coming out. So there wasn't like a Google search I could do. Proteus syndrome is an extremely rare genetic condition affecting the growth of the bone, skin, and head, with most babies starting to show symptoms between 6 and 18 months. When Alex died of a pulmonary embolism, that's when they realized pulmonary embolisms were a problem. As doctors learn more about the disease, life expectancy is improving. But for Kim and Alex, that research wasn't available in the 90s. Now we have people in their 50s, not a lot, um, but the, it's better and we have a new drug that is helping slow down the um, progression of Proteus syndrome. So people are, you know, a lot of my kids in the foundation are in their 20s, 30s. While Alex was born too soon to reap the benefits of advances in medicine, his life and legacy is a huge part of all of those advancements. And they found the cause of Proteus syndrome in 2010 using Alex's DNA. Now, Kim and her two sons honor Alex's legacy through research and supporting families. It's just been a, 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 a work of love for our whole family, trying to get rid of this disease or find a cause or a cure, which we have. Um, not a cure, but a cause. Um, to, for the thing that took our son, you know, my son and his brother away. He was born too early, but then somebody had to be, so. This is Alex. Um, this is Zern. My big brother. I might fall off. Yeah. But what do you tell him? <laughs> Hush your mouth. <laughs> Two years ago, they said he didn't have any time, and so she just started going with that and trying to make his quality of life really good. Are you smart? You know, honestly, I know I'm smart. Okay, are you good looking? <laughs> <laughs> My son was born with a rare disorder in 1990. In 1991, he was diagnosed with Proteus syndrome, and in 1992, I started the Proteus Syndrome Foundation. When he was first born, he was diagnosed with klippel turnaunay weber syndrome, which is an overgrowth syndrome as well, but I knew that that was not the correct syndrome for some reason in my heart. I just didn't feel it was right. So we kept searching, and when he was almost a year old, we went up to the Children's Hospital in Wisconsin, where we met with the doctor, Nancy Esterly, and she re-diagnosed him with Proteus syndrome. Nancy Esterly gave us um, an article on Proteus syndrome, which while reading through the article, I discovered was the same syndrome that the elephant man was diagnosed with. And uh, as you can imagine, that scared a parent to death. How old are you, Alex? <laughs> Who's the best mommy in the world? You! We are in South Wales, Australia, visiting the Kerwin family. Uh, they were one of my f early families when I founded the foundation, and we have the opportunity to come over here and see Sebastian, who's taking our drug and doing very well. I'm excited about this trip to see Sebastian on the drug and see the visible differences in his face, to see the visible differences in his his abdomen and the all the things that are changing and reducing with him. I can see what's going to happen. And seeing him offers so much hope for all my families in this in this organization. And to see this drug working, it's just it's beyond belief. It's not erased or anything, but he feels better. And to see him happy and feeling better and comfortable, and it's just, it's a good thing. I see the future in this trip. I didn't know how things would turn out with him. And I didn't know if he would live. And, and to see him not only living, but on this drug and doing better, like reversing, um, it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing. This is the first drug in a pipeline of drugs. And um, once we get this one going, and then, you know, if he does keep, continues to do better, then the next one is even gonna be a better drug. And uh, Sebastian could live a normal life. I don't know if it's the beginning of the end of Proteus, but it's definitely the beginning, a new beginning for these families. They're not, they're not gonna have to deal, hopefully, with the things that all of us early birds to Proteus syndrome had to deal with. <laughs>
home to 15-year-old Weliton de Oliveira. Like many teenagers, Weliton loves football. But his mobility is rapidly declining. A dificuldade que eu tenho é andar porque eu tenho uma perna menor que a outra e a, como eu acabo pisando na ponta do pé, a dor vem muito na ponta do pé. Weliton has a rare genetic disorder called Proteus syndrome that causes skin, muscles, fatty tissues and bones to grow out of proportion to the rest of his body. Todo dia eu sinto dor. Só que tem dia que ela é mais fraca e tem dia que ela é mais forte. E o dia que ela é mais forte é um pouco mais difícil de, de conviver. In a few days time, Weliton will be going to see a doctor in the hope that he can find a solution for his physical problems. Dia, tudo vai ficar certo e vai melhorar. Even before Weliton's birth, the prenatal scan showed something was wrong. Foi terrível, foi terrível, porque eu não sabia como que ele ia nascer, nem se ia nascer. Sofri pela, né, por saber meu primeiro filho, né, e a gente quer que nasce né, com saúde. Weliton's parents went through with the birth, but as the scans predicted, their baby was born with Proteus syndrome. A primeira vez que eu vi meu filho, eu achei que ele não fosse sobreviver. O estado dele era muito grave. Fomos em vários médicos, alguns com 30 anos de formado, nunca tinha visto. On top of this, Weliton has also been diagnosed with another rare disorder called Clipotrenoni, in which blood and lymph vessels fail to form properly. This causes port wine stains and constant bleeding through the broken vessels, and leads to additional swelling of his legs and feet. To control the swelling, Weliton has to wear special compression bandages. But this treatment is having limited success. Parece que os, os dedos, os ossos dos dedos é que estão crescendo mais. Sempre quando eu, eu sei de alguma coisa que, nova que aparece nele, me dá um medo. O Elton já foi no médico, mais que nós dois juntos vamos em nossas vidas. Eu já pensei muito em desistir de tratamento, porque muitas vezes não dá certo. But despite all his ailments, Weliton remains a happy-go-lucky, optimistic youngster. É uma criança que está sempre sorrindo. Um ser humano maravilhoso. O Elton, ele é uma criança que ele tem uma autoestima elevada. Ele é inteligentíssimo. Né? Gosta de estudar. Adora, quer crescer. Weliton is an ambitious young man who wants to go to university and have a professional career. But if his mobility continues to get worse, it could make it very hard for him to realize his dreams. So now, Weliton and his parents are pinning their hopes on a new doctor in Sao Paulo, who specializes in both Proteus and Clipotrenoni syndrome, and believes he can offer a new course of treatment for the teenager. I hope that I possa sair de São Paulo com pelo menos uma cirurgia marcada para eu conseguir minimizar um pouquinho mais da minha assim. Eu tô meio que essa fase de adolescente e tudo tá me deixando um pouco meio sem paciência para lidar com a síndrome. Eu em 40 anos em duas faculdades, eu tenho um um caso como o do Wellington. Dr. Guedes needs to do a full physical examination on Weliton. As manchas aumentaram, né? O inchaço aumentou. Ele tem uma perna mais curta que a outra. Vamos ficar sentado com as pernas para fora. Venha para cá. Se não puser a meia, você não consegue andar. Não, eu sinto dificuldade. Eu consigo andar, mas eu Vamos ficar em pé um pouquinho para mim aqui, não? Bem. Agora de costas para mim. Ele tem proteus, não tenho dúvida que é proteus. 
Dr. Guedes can only discover so much from an external exam. To find out more, he conducts ultrasound scans. He has an information of all the vasos, both the venous and the arterial, and the lymphatic. These malformations, known as fistulas, are caused by abnormal connections between Wellerton's arteries and veins. If Dr. Guedes can close them, he can reduce the swelling in Wellerton's legs and feet. Colocar uma colinha dentro dessas fístulas para diminuir a quantidade de sangue e com isso murchar a perna dele. Não é que vai murchar totalmente e ficar fantástico, mas vai murchar bem. Once the fistulas are closed, the doctor believes that Wellerton's regular bandaging treatment will be more effective in reducing his swelling. O tratamento ele visa basicamente a redução do volume dos pés, de uma maneira que ele consiga usar melhor o pé. Então que um calçado sirva melhor para ele, que eu consiga comprimir o pé para que ele ande melhor. Então agora a gente vai seguir por esse caminho. Ok? A experiência que a gente tem Nesse tipo de doença é grande, né? Eu, eu... Ok? Ok. Alguma dúvida? Não. Então, Alguma? por enquanto, foi um prazer. Felicidade para vocês. Muito Felicidade. Ok. It's not a magic bullet solution. But Wellerton and his mum both feel optimistic about the doctor's plan for the future. Ficar curado? Não. Com certeza não. Precisa ser tratado? Sim. Vai melhorar, eu não tenho dúvida. Quanto ele vai melhorar, não sei dizer, mas vai melhorar. E espero que ele melhore muito. Estou muito feliz é, com o que pode ser feito para melhorar a qualidade de vida do Eliton. E espero que dê certo mesmo, né? que o meu campeão tenha qualidade de vida. It's likely that you've at least heard of the Elephant Man before, but maybe you don't really know much about him. Here's the entire weird and tragic history of Joseph Merrick. The Elephant Man. Joseph Merrick was born on August 5, 1862 in Leicester, England, and he was born a completely healthy child with absolutely no indication that anything was or would be wrong. There are different accounts of exactly when Joseph's defigurement started to appear, but general consensus is that they didn't become severe until he was about five years old. However, he was affected by the disease before his fifth birthday. Accounts state that as early as 21 months, he began developing a swelling of his lips, followed by a bony lump on his forehead which later grew, of course, to roughly resemble an elephant's trunk. During his early years, Joseph and his mother Mary were extremely close. All things considered, Mary Merrick's story also had its fair share of tragedy. Apart from Joseph, she had three other children, but lost two of them at very young ages. Mary Merrick herself died young, passing away from pneumonia in 1873, when Joseph was only 11. As it would any loving son, her death devastated Joseph and only brought a worsening of Joseph's tragic tale. At the time of his mother's death, Joseph's deformities were severe, and Mary was essentially Joseph's closest and only friend. After Mary's death, Joseph's father, a haberdasher also named Joseph, married an extremely strict widow named Emma Wood Antill. In all her kindness, she demanded that young Merrick leave school and earn a living despite his growing abnormalities, which, as you might imagine, limited his prospects for gainful employment. However, against all odds, Joseph found a job at a cigar shop. But his career there was short-lived as his right hand soon became too large and too clumsy to do the work needed to roll cigars. Since the stipulation of Joseph earning money for the house was still intact, his father got Joseph a hawker's license to sell gloves. A hawker's license is essentially a license to be a door-to-door -door salesman. This career path too was short-lived as Joseph's appearance frightened prospective customers. Needless to say, his sales numbers were very poor through no fault of his own. But that didn't stop his father from beating him if he came home having made no sales. At the same time, his stepmother would deny him meals unless he had earned the money to pay for them. It was at this point that Joseph Merrick decided to leave his father's home. When Joseph was 17 years old, his uncle Charles Merrick took him in, but this didn't solve the problem of young Joseph finding any gainful employment. Soon after, his hawker's license was revoked, and it wasn't just revoked because he wasn't making any sales, it was revoked on the grounds that he was terrorizing the community, even though all he was trying to do was make an honest living. With no other options left, Joseph Merrick went into the Leicester Workhouse System, which was an institution where those unable to support themselves were offered accommodation and employment. Of course, the workhouses themselves were famous for their cruelty, but that was nothing new for young Joseph Merrick. He stayed in the workhouse for five years before contacting music hall showman and performer Sam Tor to see if maybe the right job for him was something he'd been dealing with his whole life. Maybe strangers should be paying to stare at him. 
This is an important note because this fact of his life has been misconstrued for dramatic purposes in plays and in movies. It was in fact Joseph Merrick who sought to show himself as a terrifying oddity as a means of financial support. This isn't to say that Joseph Merrick was looking for or deserved the unfathomable hardships that his life as a sideshow attraction would bring, but he wasn't taken advantage of by a brutal manager as is often depicted in dramatizations of his life. Sam Tor decided that he could indeed make money exhibiting Merrick by essentially turning him to a traveling exhibit. To accomplish this, Tor organized a group of managers for Joseph Merrick, music hall operator Jay Ellis, a traveling showman named George Hitchcock, and a fair operator named Sam Roper. It was this team of managers that came up with the name and began selling Joseph Merrick as, quote, the Elephant Man, advertising him as half man and half an elephant. Initially, the team showed Merrick around England's East Midlands, including Merrick's hometown of Leicester and nearby Nottingham. He was then taken to London for the winter season. George Hitchcock, one of Merrick's managers, contacted Tom Norman, a real showman who ran penny gaff shops in London's East End. A penny gaff was, quote, a popular entertainment for the lower classes in 19th century England, sometimes exhibiting human curiosities like Merrick. Without even so much as a meeting, Norman agreed to take over Merrick's management, and in November, Hitchcock traveled with Merrick to London, where he would begin his next venture. Upon first seeing Merrick, Tom Norman was initially concerned that Merrick's appearance might actually be too horrific to be successful as a novelty. Nevertheless, he decided to show Merrick as the Elephant Man in the back of a shop on Whitechapel Road. For publicity, Norman decorated the shop with posters that had been made by George Hitchcock that played up the whole half-man, half-elephant angle. The exhibit was successful, but it wasn't exactly a smash hit. In fact, the lion's share of the profits came from sales of a pamphlet that was made about Merrick. Visitors would purchase it in hopes of learning more about his history and his condition. Even with it not being a globally famous smash hit, Merrick was able to put away some of the revenue. Reports indicate that he was hoping to earn enough to one day buy a home of his own. Quite importantly, and rather fortuitously, the shop on Whitechapel Road where Merrick was on display was directly across the street from the London Hospital. This proved to be an excellent location as medical students and doctors would often come to the exhibit to see Merrick as a medical curiosity. One such visitor was a young house surgeon named Reginald Tuckett, who was so intrigued by Joseph Merrick's deformities that he told his senior colleague, Frederick Trevis, who would become an integral part of Merrick's life. A private viewing was arranged for Frederick Trevis to meet with and to view Merrick. Trevis later stated that Merrick was, quote, the most disgusting specimen of humanity that I had ever seen. At no time had I met with such a degraded or perverted version of a human being as this lone figure displayed. After this meeting, Trevis's curiosity wasn't sufficiently satisfied. He had his colleague Reginald Tuckett ask Merrick if he might be willing to come to the London hospital for an examination, to which Merrick agreed. Even to get the short distance to the hospital for examination, Merrick wore a costume to shield himself from the public. The costume consisted of an oversized black cloak and a brown cap with a burlap sack to cover his face. During Trevis's examination of Joseph Merrick, he made the following reports. He measured Merrick's head circumference to be 36 inches or 91 centimeters, which is extremely large. His right wrist was measured at 12 inches in circumference and one of his fingers at five inches. He also noted that his skin was covered in wart-like growths, the largest of which had an unpleasant smell. There were also parts of his body in which his skin sagged and hung away from the rest of his body. There were apparent bone deformities in Merrick's right arm, both of his legs, and of course, in his alarmingly oversized skull. Merrick's left arm and hand were normal by all accounts and were not deformed. His penis and scrotum were also normal and unremarkable. Apart from his deformities, Trevis concluded that Merrick appeared to be in good general health. Joseph Merrick allowed himself to be examined in such a way a handful of times before eventually putting an end to it, stating that he felt, quote, stripped naked and felt like an animal in a cattle market. At the same time, in Victorian Britain, tastes were changing in regards to freak show exhibitions like The Elephant Man. Shows like Norman's were no longer seen as entertainment, but actually as a growing cause for public concern, as they were beginning to be seen as indecent. Pretty shortly after Merrick's last examination with Frederick Trevis, the police actually closed down Tom Norman's shop and Merrick's Leicester managers withdrew him from Norman's care. With that source of revenue now shuttered, Merrick went on the road with Sam Roper's traveling fair. Unfortunately for all involved, the anti-sideshow sentiment was spreading all throughout Europe, and the traveling fair really didn't find much success. After several false starts, Merrick had no choice but to head back to London with nothing to show for his travels. However, because the tour was a bust, Merrick now had essentially no money to his name and nowhere to go. 
He was not eligible to enter a workhouse in London for more than one night because he was only eligible in Leicester because that's where he was a legally permanent resident. With no other options, Merrick approached strangers for help, but his speech was unintelligible because of his deformities and his appearance repulsed the public. At one point, a policeman had to actually help Merrick evade a crowd of people gawking at him and harassing him. The policeman helped him into an empty waiting room. Merrick tried to explain himself to the police to no avail as he could barely be understood, and he was sick and exhausted from his travels. Eventually, the police used a calling card Merrick had in his possession to contact Frederick Trevis. Of course, recognizing Merrick, Trevis took him in a cab to the London hospital and admitted him with bronchitis. Trevis washed him, fed him, and put him to bed in a small isolation room in the hospital's attic. After a series of logistical incidents and even public outcry and donations with concern for Merrick's health, it was decided that Merrick should live out the rest of his days at London Hospital. He was moved from the attic to two rooms in the basement adjacent to a small courtyard. The rooms were adapted and furnished to suit Merrick with a specially constructed bed and, at Trevis's instruction, no mirrors. During his time in the hospital, Joseph Merrick was well cared for by Trevis and his staff. Trevis even took the time to learn to decipher Merrick's speech. This was hugely important as now Merrick could carry on conversations with his friend and caretaker. Trevis visited him daily and spent a couple hours with him every single Sunday. Perhaps one of the most heartbreaking revelations was that Merrick had spent his entire life isolated from women who were repulsed by him. And it had become clear to Trevis that Merrick should be introduced to a woman to help him feel normal. Trevis arranged for a friend of his named Leela Maturin to visit Merrick and she agreed with fair warning about his appearance. Her meeting with Merrick was short, but left a lasting impression on Joseph Merrick. He told Trevis that Maturin was the first woman to ever smile at him, the first to ever shake his hand. Maturin stayed pen pals with Merrick for the rest of his days. Trevis believed that Merrick's hope was to live in an institution for the blind, where he might meet a woman who could not see his deformities. Merrick's condition gradually deteriorated during his four years at the London Hospital. He required a great deal of care from the nursing staff and spent much of his time in bed. His facial deformities continued to grow and his head became more and more dangerously enlarged. He died on April 11, 1890, at the age of 27. Trevis's house surgeon found him lying dead across his bed. Merrick had to sleep sitting up with his head resting on his knees because of the size of his skull. It's believed that he died just trying to lay down and go to sleep like everyone else. Trevis, who performed the autopsy, concluded that Merrick had died of a dislocated neck. What do you think about this video? Have you or anyone you know experienced this? Let me know in the comments below. If you liked the video, like, subscribe, and hit that bell to receive notifications of when we upload a new video. Also, check out our merch at ezinwanyi.com.